He starred in Coda, the first streaming movie to ever win an Oscar. She is a dance pro on Dancing with the Stars, and that's where they met and fell in love. We were looking at each other, and she was like, "What are you thinking about?" And I told her, "You know what I'm thinking," and we understood. Today on the Quite Frankly podcast, Daniel Durant and Britt Stewart, open and honest. And my birth mother, when I was born, she left me in a crib. For like a month, so they weren't sure if anyone took care of me. People who would go over to her house would see me in a crib, just crying, and they would try and take care of me while they were there. I was usually like the only black girl, or maybe like one of few.、Uh, ever since I wrote my goals down with the pen, my dreams and reality have both been blending in. I just hope that in the end, my debt don't extend beyond my dividends. Hey guys, <laughs> hey. <laughs> I've been waiting for this interview. Just because when I see how happy and beautiful this relationship is, it just makes me like can't wait to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean we're excited to be here. It's been amazing together. Yeah, it has, and I mean you're right. We are happy, and it's kind of weird to say that out loud、mm. because everyone always is. Wow, you look so happy. And to say it, it feels good. But yeah, we're happy. <laughs> <laughs> we're very happy. You had your little hometown date, kind of like on The Bachelor. <laughs> I, I saw on your Instagram this morning. I just popped in because you know I wasn't fully. I didn't want to overly research for this interview. I just wanted to have a real conversation. So I checked your Instagram this morning and saw that you had just come back from Minnesota. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, really, so far, it's been such a long time since I've seen my family. My family's always come to visit me in LA and seeing our Dancing with the Stars journey.、Mm. But it's time, you know. I had to go back to Minnesota, and we're dating, so I wanted her to go to Duluth, Duluth, where I was raised, <laughs> my hometown. I wanted her to see how beautiful the place is and how it's a small community. So it's nice that she came,、mm. and we were with my family, and we went out outdoors a lot. We saw the beach. And she went to the air show with me, and that's my favorite air show. I've been going every year since I was a kid. So Britt came, and she heard the loud airplanes, and she had goosebumps just like me. And of course, I talked about every plane. I know all the names. <laughs> so she listened, and she's a great listener. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. I mean, I know this about Daniel. He is an airplane nerd,、mm. like big time. But I love that.、Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was really special. Duluth is a special place. I mean, I'm biased because it's it's where Daniel's from.、Um, but yeah, it's just beautiful, and it feels like like a brother of Denver.、Mm. That's where I'm from. It was nice to spend time with his family. It felt like. I just like fit in. I was there. I, yeah, I had、definitely. to keep reminding him that it was my first time there、mm. <laughs> because I was like, "Hey, remember, it's my first time here in Duluth."、But、why? Why? Why would you have to keep reminding? What was happening? <laughs> Honestly, I've never felt like that before with someone who just come、mm. and joined with me and my family. And my family was like, "Dude, she's in our home. It feels like she belongs, and she's been here."、Mm. But no, it's her first time here, and. But I mean, our feelings and our energy, she fits in. It was meant to be all along. So when she came, it was great, and it was—it's like, wow, we have to remind ourselves. You're right. It's your first time here. It feels like you've been here before. It's a little weird, but I'm looking forward to her coming over and over in the future. But one challenge for her in the future is coming to Duluth in the winter. Nah.、Uh, <laughs> well, she's from Denver,、ready. though. Whoa, this is different. Cold.、Uh, I mean, his mom. Yes, it's different. His moms were talking about like. Negative, negative, thirty-five. Wow. Yeah, I remember when I was a young kid, I'd go skiing. Negative twelve. It's all good. <laughs> good for your skin, I think. It's like cryotherapy. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> It's pretty good. So I'm glad I didn't prepare because now I have so many questions just from watching the two of you interact. So, Britt, you know, and just to give context to the people watching, I was the backstage host at Dancing with the Stars, one of them, for Good Morning America's coverage for like seven seasons. So I knew you at that level, but I never 
saw you because I wasn't there for this season. I never saw the two of you together and the interaction. So I'm kind of witnessing it like everybody else for the first time. How quickly did you pick up sign? Mm -hmm. Because you seem pretty natural with it now, right? Kind of like tell me about that process and then I'll get into the other stuff that came up. When Daniel and I first met, I knew no ASL. Mm. I maybe like a few of the ABCs, but that's it. It was always a goal, goal, to, to learn ASL because I wanted to really teach him how to dance. I think Dancing with the Stars is so special because of the connection yeah. and because of the journey that you go on with your partner. So I knew right away, I was like, I'm learning ASL, this is it. Yes. How cool. But then, of course, after the season, we started dating. And now ASL is just it's part of my everyday life. And I think it's beautiful. It's a beautiful language that now I love. And it's been amazing learning about the deaf community and about deaf culture. It's completely new to my world. And yeah, it feels like my whole life is just different from a year ago. Happy different, it's good what, different. What about, so, because I was on the season where Niall was on, Niall mm -hmm. DeMarco, who mm -hmm. uh, was also deaf. I remember from that season also, the big challenge, I think, for dancing was that, you know, normally the dancer would be saying one and two and three. Like, we can't hear it because the music is so loud, but the dancer, like PETA in that season, would be whispering in his ear one and two and three, but I couldn't, right? Yeah. And that was like the big challenge is that she could not do that mm -hmm. as the other uh, c competitors would have. Yeah. Is that something that, can, like, can you explain that? Of course. It was, it was really interesting because First, I thought, okay, I'm going to learn five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> uh, did I use that? No, <laughs> never, mm. but that's okay. And yes, you're right. During the season and during the live show, the pros talk to your partner. You're like helping them remember what the next dance step is. Oh, and, during the dance? Oh yeah like live, oh. during the live so show. So we can't see it and we can't even no. hear you guys, but you're no. saying instructions? Yeah, and oh. I, yeah, I decided to not let Daniel in on this information because I didn't, I didn't want it to block his process at all. But one show, you remember you looked at me and you asked, what is everyone talking about? Oh. <laughs> Do you remember that? Like all, like all the other couples were talking during yes, the dance? Yes, yes, you're yeah. right. I didn't notice that until during one of the live shows, I could see them yelling at each other. It looked like, you know, they were speaking seriously. And I asked, are they, are they talking while they're dancing? He said, yes, they all do that. And I didn't notice that. Maybe it was the third week. Of competition. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, the pros are counting, counting. They're, they're remembering the choreography, like yelling out dances. And so, really, Daniel had to learn every part of a dance. Like, when we were doing the live show, live dance, he was, he was on his own. Like, I couldn't communicate really about what the next step was. Could you come up with codes? Like, okay, if I, when I wink, it's a remember <laughs> to like toss me in the air, you know? <laughs> you know, we didn't, we didn't do that. Not because... really, not much. Maybe a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't really, when you're dancing, focus on that anyway, right. probably, right? Right. Yeah. She'd try before to tap me as a cue. Mm. In that moment before like a beat starts or something, but we figured that was distracting for me, mm -hmm. actually. And she tried to count. And I can feel the vibration for the music, but it's kind of the same. It's distracting to me. I want to focus and make sure my steps are sharp. Mm. So I have to remember all the movements. So it's tough for me. Sometimes in my mind, I forget what's next. 
but what do I do? I just have to trust her and I have to mm-hmm. follow her and feel our bodies together. She's been a professional dancer forever, so I use her muscle memory and she kind of jogs mine and I'm like, oh, I got it. And it wasn't easy, but it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. Mm. We really used our connection because Daniel's right. He learned the choreography to remember that. He learned the rhythm. He learned the timing, like fast, slow, fast, slow, or, you know, quick, quick, slow, quick, quick, slow. He had to remember all parts of it, Mm. which, I mean, that was amazing. I I tried. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if people know, like, how much work he really did. Mm. Tell me about the necklaces you're both wearing. There, and for people who are listening and not watching this, but just <laughs> listening, that you have uh, a sign uh, symbol. What is that symbol? So that's a sign for I love you. Mm. Because that's I, L, and then uh, Y, it's all attached. So I love yes. you. Yes, yeah. Okay, cool. That's what it is. And who got it for who? <laughs> really, we both received it from... Uh, she's a great sponsor of the Deaf Organization and Rights, mm. and we, she... We bought the necklaces and she donated it. So we got them as gifts. Wow. My family has some. But really, I have this I love you on my chest because I'm proud to represent for the deaf community. It's our language. It's our culture. And I'm proud. And obviously, she's into the deaf community now. And it's an honor. She's she's a member. I remember thinking um, with, with, with Niall season, he said something in an interview with me once. He said, I could never date anybody that was not, that doesn't know sign. Right. And I remember thinking, well, that's it for me. And no, I'm just kidding. No, I remember thinking, uh, <laughs> I remember thinking, like, I wonder if that's just something you say in the moment. But, you know, a person because a person can always learn, especially like, are you saying that you're not interested in somebody not willing to learn? Because that's obvious. Right. Mm-hmm. But what if somebody doesn't and could just pick it up as you did, Britt? You know, so I always I mean, this is not really a question. It's just a thought. <laughs> no, I'm happy you brought that up because. To let you know, I mean, deaf people aren't all the same. Mm. There's a whole diversity to deaf range. Some people sign very well, and some people barely sign, and they speak, and they can hear well. There's deaf and hard of hearing people. So my background, I was adopted with a hearing family, and they taught me to sign, and I picked it up myself growing up from a small, again, Duluth. It's a small town. But Niall, he was born to a deaf family. Mm. He went to a deaf school, so he's a strong in his deaf culture and his deaf identity. So we were very different in how we were raised there. So yeah, some right. deaf people have no tolerance to teach sign for their own reasons, and that's not bad. I, I don't judge what their lives are like and what they've been through. We're all oppressed every day in our own lives, so you know, if you don't feel like teaching someone sign, but for me, it's a bit different. I was always enthusiastic to teach someone who is interested in learning ASL. I always teach people funny, dirty signs. It's always smart. <laughs> Some cool signs I like to teach people, and people like it. So I love doing that. Especially with Britt. Yeah. For Dancing with the Stars, I really wanted to train together with her. And I didn't expect wow. her to pick it up. I didn't expect that at all. I just mm-hmm. thought Gabe and I would teach her a bit. But she's such a great receptor. Gabe will speak, and she's watching while I'm signing. And naturally, mm-hmm. she picked it up. It took one, two, maybe three weeks, and she started signing. And I didn't expect that. It was natural. And she grew herself. Because a person like her wanted to connect with me. She wanted to be truly connected. And that made all the difference when she learned a new language. I think some, I mean, we've talked about it a lot. I think some hearing people, not all, but some, they're, it's almost like they're nervous to communicate mm. with someone that's deaf because they don't they don't speak the same language and of course in general people aren't used to using their hands and their body to move and communicate and you use your face and you use your eyes and we have more eye contact and it's out of the comfort zone for most hearing people maybe Mm -hmm. i'll never forget when we started dancing and i watched her eyes and she moved her eyes she'd have a hard time (laughs) keeping that eye contact with me but later she got used to it interesting do you i wonder why (laughs) <laughs> honestly i felt like he was looking into my soul that's mm. why we've talked about this he thinks it's because just you know another hearing person like can't make eye contact 
<laughs> he's doing it. He's doing it now, but now, now I'm ready. You know, that's a really good, um, there's a technique where if you look at somebody, I think it's three minutes up to 10 with the outbreaking eye contact, it, they say like, it's like, um, it's, it's very headline-y, but they'll say that you'll fall in love. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've done it and you actually, you should try it because you start to see the person morph. It's almost like you see their ancestors or their past lives. Like you literally cool. just start seeing different faces within that face. Mm. You see sadness, you see the happiness. It's almost like it, it can't hide. Yeah. We should That's try right. That. We didn't even try it. We already have no. that. <laughs> you already know. I've seen what kind of mood you're in. You see what kind of mood I'm in. It's oh, always. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always. So I uh, interrogated Gabe here a little bit <laughs> right before the interview, and, he, and I asked him, like, could you see them kind of falling in love or falling for each other throughout that dancing journey? And he said, oh, yeah, like even before they said anything. Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that from, like, your perspective? Well, during that time, again, I was focused on the competition, on Dancing with the Stars. I wanted to win. I wanted to get a mirror ball for her. And... Mm. And at first we were like best friends and Gabe knew we were like best friends. And then one day I started feeling something and I felt for her. And of course I talked with Gabe and you know, it breaks, we'd be in our apartment hanging out and we'd talk and Gabe was like, oh yeah, of course you do. She <laughs> likes you. She likes you, dude. Like it's obvious. And I'm, I'm like, you're dumb, dude. Are you serious? And I was like, uh, I was nervous. Okay, let's see. And then after Dancing with the Stars was finished, we were looking at each other and she was like, what are you thinking about? And I told her, you know what I'm thinking. And mm. we understood. Yeah. So after that, we're dating. Yeah. Wow. And like, even then that first conversation, nothing happened. We just looked at each other and we understood and we walked away and we went to dinner. We went to dinner with Gabe <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then it progressed from there. But yeah, it's interesting. We were, were best friends during the season. And then now, like we look back at videos of us and we're like, we're the exact no same. Difference. Like there's no difference. And looking back, we see what everyone, we see what everyone else saw in us. Mm. Yeah. Oh God, I have so much places <laughs> to go. Because uh, I don't also don't want to make it all about, like, this is not an interview. The deaf, deafness should be something that's mentioned for viewers to know what's yeah. going on. But I, like, there's so much more I want to know about you and about life. But then something did pop into mind. Daniel was saying, feeling vibration. I think it's mm -hmm. when we were talking about the pla uh, planes. I just watched a video a few days ago about cobras and how they're deaf, but they are so sensitive to vibration. And not just vibration in the sense of like a rumbling, but vibration as in like positive, negative, comfortable, uncomfortable. And so they say when there's a yogi in the woods, a lot of times, and if they're in a really enlightened state, there'll be a lot of cobras around them. And it's be, and, or at the ashrams where people go and meditate, there are a lot of cobras there. And they're totally safe, like nobody gets hopefully uh, bitten and um, people are not afraid of them and they're just walking around. And it's, they say they go there because they're so sensitive to that vibration. Wow. Can I go first? Yeah. I mean, growing up, really, I can't remember what my background was before I was adopted. I do have trauma and stuff, but I guess the stuff that happened, I, I feel like I can, read, I can read people well now. It's my self-protection. I'm very natural with that growing up. Mm. And I realized that because when my mom adopted me, of course, she would take me to her friends and I'd socialize. And I would mention that I don't like some people. And my mom always understood why. I trusted my intuition. I could feel that. So, you know, she says that I was looking into her soul, ha, ha, ha. But yeah, I can feel people's energy and how they're doing and how they're reacting. And I can feel if it's good vibes or negative energy. You know, I can feel that naturally. Yeah, I feel that. And, you know, we're so different. But I feel like I'm the same. And that's interesting when you talk about the vibration i never knew that mm. about cobras mm -hmm. but me neither yeah <clears throat> that's new to me yeah but i really believe that daniel has a special sense that not 
it's it's not a death thing. It's a Daniel thing that just makes you special. Mm. Thank you. She's, <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Thank it's you. It's true. It's really true. Yeah. And I don't like I don't know if it's because of your trauma and being adopted and your journey in this life, but it's that mixed with being deaf and mixed with being Daniel and it's just it's just you. That's why I like her. <laughs> <laughs> no, she understands me she very sees deeply you. Yeah. and I've never met anyone like her. And when we started dating, it's only grown more deeper and she learns more about deaf culture. And mm. she has fun with ASL. She makes ASL jokes. She doesn't <laughs> copy me or copy other people's signs. She mm. invents her own. With, and she's funny visually and I'm impressed. She understands <laughs> our culture. So I've never met anyone like her. But I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to the vibrations thing a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I do feel a different kind of vibration. I'm very sensitive, so like if a plane goes over, but I notice hearing people depend on sound, and maybe that blocks their vibration a bit. I'm completely deaf, so my other senses are a bit more sensitive. So yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I can see that. I mean, a lot of times in my meditation too, I'll blindfold myself because I feel like if I lose that sense, I, I'm more empowered in going within and trusting mm -hmm. myself. You know, we're always used to like, look at your phone when you want to know what the weather is. My GPS, we're always turning to something rather than trusting ourselves and knowing that maybe I have the answer. So maybe, you know, and again, it's not all deaf people, but maybe he's trained himself to do that. You know, maybe yeah. you've done that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Thank you. Yeah. You know, we've talked about this because I think you know I meditate mm -hmm. and um, we've talked because the kind of meditation that I do is usually, it's sound based and it's with music or, um, or you like close your eyes and so, you know, like first thing is I'm like, okay, is there like some sort or some sort of like vibration meditation that everyone mm. can enjoy to really make meditation inclusive. inclusive. There is actually, there really? is. I have, to, I have to look into that for you and see. Um, I have a few devices that are vibration based mm. and you wear them. Actually, there's one I won't talk about because I'm not in love with it, but there's another that you wear around uh, your wrist or your ankle, it's called Apollo and it sends certain vibrations. So it's less meditation and more putting your body into that state using oh. vibrations. Interesting. Yeah. Oh. Cool. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, it's connected to this, but we've discussed, you know, hearing people like white noise or hearing music yeah. Yeah. to help them sleep or relax. But I've noticed myself, vibration is my white noise. That makes me sleep. Mm. Like every time I'm in a long car ride or an airplane, and that feeling, the engine, it makes me knock out. It's like, wow. The first time we went on a cruise, or the first time I've been on a cruise, I went with Brit, and I enjoyed it so much because I could just lay down and relax. And yeah. sometimes we like to find some noise or like a vibration thing, mm -hmm. and you could put it near me, and I'll, it'll help me sleep. And when I'm stressed out, there's something about vibrations that calms me down. We've yeah. talked about that. When I interviewed uh, Sharna and Brian, Austin Green, he was saying, you know, I saw Sharna dancing and it was always impressive, but I expected it to be impressive. Like she's a dancer. Only when he did it, did he realize, whoa, like how amazing it actually is. Mm -hmm. They're not just doing a couple of twirls like, or whatever else. It's, it's a real art and it's hard. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes, definitely. Really, before I came here for Dancing with the Stars, I got a small dance lesson and I started touching a couple of dance styles. And I still didn't have any deep understanding of dance. And then I met Britt, and we started training, and I saw how she moved. And I was like, oh, shit, well, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> and after learning her background and how she's just a loyal dancer, she's committed mm. her whole life to dance ever since she was a kid. So that's why she's so good at it now. And that's, I have this massive respect for her. Of course, I would love to be, be as good as these pros, but where was I growing up when I was, I wasn't dancing, I just started now. So that's why I'm blown away when she taught me the different dance names and the histories behind them and I'm watching the other pros and especially I love watching Brit dance. So mm. after that, I have so much respect for everyone. I tell all the pros, great job, I have massive respect for them. 
And Daniel mentioned... Oh. And she deserves her recognition, that. Mm. And Daniel mentioned that, um, you know, you grew up in this industry, mm -hmm. right? You grew yeah. up in the world, the world of dance. I know, like, when I spoke to Sharna, she was like, Frank, I thought I was just going to be a, a ballroom dancer going around competing all over the world. And I was okay with that. That was my life. Then Dancing with the Stars came along and just changed everything. Mm -hmm. Did you also think you would just go down that path, competing, and then all of a sudden, bam? Honestly, I didn't know. Like, really, to be honest, I just knew that I loved dance. Mm. And I started when I was three. Dance was the only thing I wanted to, I wanted to do. That was it. It made me happy. I was talking to my mom the other day, and she told me as a baby, music and dance was the only thing that would stop my crying because I was colicky. I don't, mm. actually, I don't know how to spell that colic. <laughs> oh yeah, C O L I C K Y. I think. <laughs> what is colicky? It's um, it's when you have like stomach. It's when babies um, their stomach hurts. I mm. think, but it's something with digesting the milk. I think. So I was just I would cry because my stomach would hurt, and um, and yeah, my my grandma would put on music and dance with me, and that's and that would and that would help me to stop crying. When I was 15 is when I felt like I could really dance mm. for work. And interesting, I was talking to my therapist, talking about life, and she asked me if I feel like my life is guided. Thanks, Gabe. Guided. Um, and yeah, like really, I just, I just let like love lead me, and I've just been very blessed that my life is guided, that I can experience these new, different, expansive experiences in my life. I know that was like really deep for just No, and I want to go even deeper life, though, because I want to <laughs> ask about diversity too, yeah. right? Because you do work with um, nonprofit that supports diversity in dance. Mm -hmm. I was just in Florida, I think I messaged you, mm -hmm. and I saw this competition, and 90% of the people, Eastern European, yeah. right? What was it like to look around and be like, I don't really look like anyone here? Yeah. Growing up, I was really, I was only, I was usually like the only black girl, or maybe like one of few, but I see my, um, my privilege, and I know that my parents put everything into my dance training. Mm. And I am, like, I am so grateful for my parents because of that. They, they weren't afraid of dance or, you know, being an artist. They really, they really, really supported me. Mm. Um, so now that I have this opportunity to give back, it's, it's amazing. I never want a black or brown kid to feel like they don't have access to anything mm. they want to do. And now like and now really that's expanded for me now being, you know, in deaf culture and deaf community as well. It's like everyone should have access to what they're passionate about. So working with my nonprofit organization has been amazing. We, um, myself and our founding board members. Oh, so you're a founder of this? Yes. Whoa, yes. that's great, Britt. Yes, I'm president of it cool. and a founding board member, which is very exciting. Yeah. We started creating it in 2020. And at the same time, we were talking about and creating this mission about diversity in dance, I became the first black um, female pro on Dancing with the Stars, like really showing that representation. What year was that? That was in 2020. Oh, it was in 2020. Yeah. Because I actually want to ask you about that too. And I know you're currently there, so I don't, and I don't want to throw a show or anything under or a network under a bus, right? Because we're all learning as we grow. But do you think it was like about time I mean, it's like 20-something seasons, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I remember seeing you as a, 
when I first started covering the show, you were a troop dancer. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't know, those are kind of like in between the dances or, you know, as the show opens and closes, things like that, right? Like mm -hmm. you're supporting the main cast. I'm a believer in timing. So I am grateful for my five years mm -hmm. on, or five seasons on troop. <laughs> that was so low <laughs> on troop. Um, but really it's ballroom dance. It's not diverse. But it's rooted, it's rooted in black and brown culture. Competitive ballroom dance was, I think my history is right. Mm. I hope so. But the competitive part of it was started in Eastern Europe or just in Europe in general. Um, but like cha-cha, the base of it is mer merengue, the three, and then it became the three-step, the cha-cha-cha. It was all based on music. Um, Foxtrot actually comes from black jazz clubs here in America. Mm. So those are just two examples. Samba is, you know, the origin is Brazil and Africa. Um, and so then it became this new sort of dance style that really was heavy in um, Europe. It's also really prevalent in Asia as well. Um, but I also think it's black culture. Um, the black community doesn't really think that ballroom is an option. So it's just, it's just not diverse. So really, I don't, I don't blame Dancing with the Stars. I don't blame anyone. I just think now is the right time. And now we're diversifying that specific dance style. Mm, which is such a beautiful outlook to have. And it's oh. like, right, not, not, I'm not angry at it, I'm not blaming, I'm just more like, okay, let's embrace the time that we're in now. Yeah, like I said, it's just not a diverse style. So there really weren't many options. And I mean, I'm grateful that Dancing with the Stars saw me as that option mm. to to be the representation for for a black woman. And does your nonprofit is it helping with like? Because I remember, so I was speaking at a biohacking conference in Florida, and there was at the same time this like dance competition, and the there was one part of it where there people could go and buy gowns and things like that, and they were like four grand, five grand. And this is like obviously something that they're going to want to compete in and, mm -hmm. and dazzle and have an advantage. But yeah, it's not accessible to everyone, right? And um, is that something that you guys help with? Yeah, our organization, um, <clears throat> we start with the foundation. So like ages eight years old. Mm. And we really, really, we like to say that we provide a hug of support for any BIPOC dancer. So that's financially, that's educationally, that's inspirationally. We just support fully. Let's talk about the Band-Aid. Yeah. And then I, I want to move on, but the Band-Aid part of your collaboration now, because I just saw, I think it was Whoopi Goldberg a few days ago, and she was in her, she was like in her glam getting ready, and uh, she was like, I found, look at this, there's a black Band-Aid, and she was so excited about it. Oh, I am very excited about this because Share the Movement is partnering with Band-Aid and specifically their Our Tone Band-Aids, which is three different skin tone in black and brown skin shades for, for kids, adults, all of the black and brown communities. So we are producing in partnership with Band-Aid three community dance events free dance classes, Q&As, discussion panels, showing that any skin tone, that our tone uplifts community. And we're doing that through movement and dance. Beautiful, amazing. You mentioned something earlier, um, I can't remember who said, I think, I think it was you, Britt, and you said Daniel's moms. Mm -hmm. Is that plural? That is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Really, I have four moms. Mm. They go all the way. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? A lot of love. So tell me a little bit about growing up with, because I think you said early on I had to adapt. And, and this is something that's very common in 
in LGBT community and a lot of communities where you feel like you have to, they say that they become CEOs and powerful people a lot of times because they're used to from a young age explaining to maybe people or like having to navigate certain situations. Is that something that you feel like you did? That's a great question. Yes. I mean, I remember when I was in school, I felt like, of course, there's my mom's, hmm. but I would see mom and dad, mom and dad around. And then I spoke with some other students and I would say, yeah, my mom's. And they would say, no, you're wrong. Mom yeah. and dad, remember dad? And I'd say, no, I have two moms. And they'd literally correct me and say, no, dad. And a teacher would come and say, no, <laughs> no, he has two moms. Yes, his moms are married. And kids would look at me all confused. And that's where I realized this isn't normal for them. But for me, I mean, I'm adopted. This is perfect. This is my family. I'm connected. Mm -hmm. Everything's normal. This is life. We're in love. We're happy. But that's where it hit me hard in elementary school, seeing that confused look and seeing it wasn't normal for most people. So yeah, I went through hard times in mainstream school, but in the future, I've had yearbooks and I'd ask some kids to sign my yearbook. And some kids, I didn't think would sign my yearbook, but they went ahead and signed it. And when I was older, I found my yearbook. And I went through it, and I remember looking at these old signatures, and some people wrote, you're so gay, ha 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 ha, Whoa. and signed their name. But as a kid, I never read it, or I didn't understand. I didn't understand what it meant. So I just brushed it off. But finding that as an adult, and pointing it out to my mom, and saying, mm. look, that boy wrote that. And my mom said, yeah, I know. Yeah, that's how it is out there. So I didn't realize that till an adult, but I know my moms have been through a lot. A lot of students I were with were negative about my moms because of their religion or the way they were raised, and they bullied me because of them. But growing up, I didn't understand. I, I blamed them or I blamed me, but I didn't realize it was because of my mom. Mm. And then moving to a deaf school, I was a little embarrassed about it. And I decided to just <laughs> admit it and say, yeah, I have moms. And that was fine. No one bullied me about it. I was respected at the deaf school. And they all loved my moms. They came to visit, and they'd watch my plays and my sports, and my moms were always so friendly with my friends. Everyone loved my moms. So I remember that acceptance, and I felt normal, and my moms were cool. But just that moment in elementary school, I'll never forget. It wasn't normal for them. I wonder if being in deaf school was different because those kids have already been used to being different in some way and so for them maybe they're more accepting yeah that's what i think but it's unfortunate during my time there at the school for the deaf they were so against the lgbt community no kid wanted to get out of the closet it was very toxic at our school so i remember personally for that but mm. recently i visited that school again i did i gave a graduation speech and things have changed yeah i saw students openly gay and i was like yes I wish I had that during my time, but I'm happy to see things changing, and that's important. Fast forward a little bit be after those years, and you're like, I want to be an actor, I'm going to do it professionally. Did anyone say, moms or anybody, what are you thinking? You know, there aren't those roles right now, or whatever else you heard. <laughs> yeah. So, it's funny, my mom, Lori, she was an actor herself in high school for fun. She knew play and theatrical, but she never thought I would really become an actor. And at that time, I had just graduated from high school, the school for the deaf, and I started up my own YouTube channel, and my mom was like, hey, stop, you need to save your money, focus your time, get ready for college, and understand my mom's, both of my mom's backgrounds, they're educational people. Mm. My grandfather was on the board of education, my grandmother was a principal, my mom's a teacher, so they're like educational track. You need a degree, you need to go to college, you need a steady job, that's their perspective. But I've always felt like a black sheep in my family because that wasn't my goal. I tried to go to college, I tried to find my major in IT, and I wasn't happy, and I decided to leave. And my mothers were upset, but I was stubborn and I continued. I was passionate about being an actor until I auditioned for Deaf West Theater here in LA. I got a role and I grew from there. So it's funny, you know, uh, Coda won the Oscar 
the Oscar winning film. First yeah. Oscar for Apple. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so we were all in an SUV and I tapped my mom. Remember we argued and I look where I'm at now. My mom just had to laugh. <laughs> I felt so good seeing my mom have to suck that one up. But at the same time, I don't blame them. I know all parents want what's best for their children in the future. So I'm proud of myself that I was stubborn and I believed in myself and my passion and I was right. For a movie actor, it doesn't get higher than getting an Oscar. So what was it like to take mom there? Wow, I mean, it was amazing. I couldn't believe that my mom's partied so hard. They said, <laughs> Just champagne with Robert De Niro. <laughs> yeah, they partied with everyone. They met whoever they could at me. They were just having fun all, all the way till five. They usually go to sleep at eight or nine, but that night they went to sleep at five. I mean, they were overwhelmed and excited. And Britt, so would you, were, do you, had you already seen Coda beforehand? Yeah, I had seen it the summer before we met, and my best friend showed it to me. And when I found out that Daniel was my partner for last season, I called my best friend. I was like, you will never guess who my partner is. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I loved the movie. I had seen it, I think, maybe like three times before we met. Mm. Um, yeah, I felt connected to it right away. You guys are moving in together. Can we talk about that? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> we live together, and I mean, I'm madly in love with her cats. Her cats are my favorite pets in the world. <laughs> I dote on them a lot as much as I can. And I love them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're moving in together. And um, actually, like, now. Right like now. Like, you're in the process. Yeah, we're in the process. And it's been, it's been really special. I also, like, I moved out of my, of my apartment. I know we talked about this. And it was, yeah. it was a really emotional experience for me. I was there since 2015. Mm. And, you know... Like, really, I feel like I became a woman there. So it was this, like, weird thing for me to experience and this, like, new growing experience. I was like, okay, wow. Like, all the memories were just, like, rushing in as I was leaving. I was leaving my key. Wow. My key on the counter. It's like, okay. Wow. New chapter. Yeah. New chapter. Hmm. <laughs> so let's talk about the cats a little bit because I want to know more about this. So I have obviously two cats I showed you before, Sebastian and Selma. Graham's laughing behind the camera because I literally will do an interview. Sharna, for example, uh -huh. she's like, I always bring my cats into it and it's never realistic. He, to me it is, but she was talking about intrusive thoughts and she's like, you know, I have these... Dream, these, these dreams and these thoughts that the chandelier is going to fall on my baby. Oh. Sometimes I'm driving in the car and I just imagine the car is going to flip over and I'm going to have to, and I go, I get it, I have two cats. <laughs> <laughs> and Graham is just like, are you an idiot? <laughs> no, same. I, I'm so sorry, but I can relate to this here. I really can. Like Orly and Hudson, they're my sons. I'm sorry. Orly and Hudson? Yeah, yeah. Orlando yeah. and Hudson. Um, so this is funny. Many people always ask me about this, but um, Orlando and Hudson, actually, before were Artem's cats. Whoa! Yeah. And um, so, for people who don't know, he's another yes. pro dancer on Dancing with the Stars, yeah. who's married to Nikki Nikki Bella. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it started with me just cat sitting them and just watching them and. Now they're mine. Whoa, <laughs> now they're, how did that happen? We didn't really like talk about it. Um, <laughs> Does know. he know you have them, Brit? <laughs> Artem, if you're listening to this, I have your cats. No, he knows. He knows. He knows. We communicated about that. You know that they're still good and that I have them. Um, but yeah, I just think that he he was moving into a different part of his life. So. Um, and, the, and he came over and saw them, and so I think he saw that they were, they were in good hands and, you know, well taken care of. So, I mean, wow. now they're my sons. Like, I 
love them. And <laughs> yes, they are very connected to Daniel and very connected to us. Um, like I feel bad right now. They're very, they're very stressed because we were gone in Minnesota and then now like their whole world is moving around. And, right. Yeah. But it's a okay. lot. It's a lot. See, it is, it's, it is the same. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, let's talk about Broadway a little bit too. Tell me a little bit about the experience of being on stage. So really, I want to give a little background. Uh, I'm a strong stage actor ever since I was nine years old from Duluth. I was always comfortable on stage. That's my skill and that's where I'm natural. Mm. So being involved in Deaf West Theater in 2012, I moved here. And I had never experienced musicals before. I'm fully deaf, I can't hear anything. And then it happened, one director watched my play, Flowers for Algernon, where I was a leading role, Charlie. I had to act like I had like brain surgery and I became brilliant. I become the smartest man in the world and then something goes wrong and I go all the way back and I lose all of my brain. And so it was a tough character to play. And one director saw and liked my work and decided to give me the leading role. There was no audition, and that was my first time experiencing something like that. And I didn't know what Spring Awakening was, and it was a musical, and I was frozen. I said, musical, like, at the time I had no idea. How could I do that? I can't hear anything. I had no idea how it would work. I was so nervous. So I said, fine, and I did it, and I learned the process, how to catch the beat, and it was a wonderful crew. There were so many different cues on stage. For example, one of our cast on stage, everyone's standing next to a bed. And if everyone gets on their knees, that means it's my time, the song's starting. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they hand me a paper. And the song's going on on the side, and they give me a paper. And as soon as someone walks by and grabs my paper, that means my part's starting, and I start singing. Wow. And I have a voice actor who's alongside me, and he sings my lines. And he was always by my side during the play. We, both of us were like one character, right? We were two heads in one character. So sometimes he was singing and he would hit his chest and I'd know what part of the song he was hitting because of when he hit his chest. So I learned all the cues and I found that I was talented and I could still fit the music because I felt like it's expression. You know, you're expressing art still. It's like you hear the singing and how that's an art with the background and the music. I'm expressing visually and I'm trying my best to hit those notes with the voice actor. So yeah, it's really interesting for a hearing audience because you can hear the music and see me at the same time, see the signs and go along with the words and it's a new experience and I feel like the end result it was good because they got Tony nominated and I got to go to the Tonys. Whoa. And it was a great memory. And really, I miss being on Broadway ever since. I was on TV and movies, and I'm so thankful for that. But it's interesting. I look at the Broadway world as, I mean, it's even smaller. There's no deaf roles. TV mm -hmm. and movie, I'm so excited because TV and movies are growing. There's more deaf roles, and please keep that up. But Broadway, please. Broadway's starting to lag behind. But I'm excited to let you know I'm working on one play, and hopefully that one goes to Broadway. And mm. I'll be back on Broadway soon. <laughs> you really have to be a strong actor. A lot of times, like even Hollywood actors will go to England to study stage acting and then come back here and use that. I wonder, what do you think the, the difference is? Is it that you're more expressive? Like, what is different that's happening on stage? Yeah, it's a big difference. Um, on stage, you're right. You have to have a lot more energy. For example, on Broadway, it's a huge audience. There's 1,000 seats in the theater. Mm. So you have to reach the back of the room. You have to have that feeling you have to hit the whole audience and you want them to feel it that's the goal and of course if you forget a line during a play there's no editing you have to improv <laughs> you cover it you you know you hide it so that's happened to me a few times but it's fun you cover it and you go on and it's fine and when it comes to film i'll tell you a funny story because again i grew up on stage and my first TV show was Switched at Birth. And I was so excited. Mm -hmm. It was my first time meeting Marley Matlin. I was so nervous and Marley was all cool. Like, come on, Daniel. <laughs> so we started filming and I was signing all crazy. And then, you know, they're like, cut, hold on. And they cut on me. And the ASL master came to me and her job is to watch the screen while I'm signing. 
and make sure that mm. you don't cut off any signs and things like that. And she ran over to me and said, calm down. Your energy is exploding <laughs> on the screen. You're in everyone's face. This is a stage. Calm down, chill out. Sign like you're signing every day. And I was embarrassed. In front of everyone, the whole cast saw that. And I was like, okay. And again, I, you know, I, I gave a little less and it was better. But that was my first time being on TV and I learned that lesson and never forgot it. But yes, it's totally different. And in TV, if you forget your line or whatever, you can do it again until they get it perfect. And then you go on. Well, any final thoughts, you guys? This has been so insightful. I'm I know. Final thoughts. <laughs> what keeps I you up at night? <laughs> what keeps us up at night? Oh my God. That... What keeps me up at night? Mm, games. That, uh, that is... No, but is there like a lingering thing that keeps coming back? I mean, you spoke a little bit about trauma. I mean, I think, uh, I think for me, yeah. do I stay up at night from that? No, I like, I like being up at night. I think I'm just a night owl. I like having energy at night. But, but related to my trauma, I remember my mom who adopted me didn't know. But my biological father, I see my biological father sometimes. And mm. he said he did hurt. I was hurt when I was a baby. And my birth mother... When I was born, she left me in a crib for like a month. So they wasn't sure if anyone took care of me. People who would go over to her house would see me in a crib just crying and they would try and take care of me while they were there. Wow. So that's what they told me. Of course, I can't remember anything. Your body remembers. Yeah. Is the thing. Yes. It yeah. Does, definitely. Because I see how my body reacts and that's trauma. Yeah. Yeah. I've already seen a therapist and she says that's trauma. And sometimes I have bad dreams when I sleep and I'll move and I'll wake up suddenly and scream. And obviously that's trauma. Mm, yeah. But I did speak with therapists and try to get to the bottom of it. But I don't know. It's stuck. I feel like I'm just going to wake up like that sometimes for the rest of my life. I think it's hard to like go through life with no trauma. I think like really spirit, that's why we choose to be here is Thank to you. experience the human trauma and like what it's like to have that like contrast of just human life. So yeah, like I know I have trauma and like different <laughs> from Daniel, like that does, like that will keep me up at night. And I have very like vivid, vivid dreams um, and really it's like, it's my process of healing. I think, I think that's what it is. That's who we are. We accept who we are. And if you accept yourself and you yeah. know what to do with yourself, you're okay. I will say that like this time right now in life has been really beautiful. Like really I'm in a relationship where I feel like I am myself all the time, you know, Daniel knows everything about me, about like my life, my family life. Yeah, you make me feel like accepted and that it's okay. Um, so I'm also learning to accept trauma and accept like that what happens in life is meant to be and it's okay, mm. it's just human. I was in Costa Rica la last week, actually, or like 10 days ago, and I was working with ayahuasca, the plant medicine. Mm. Is there a sign for that? <laughs> and the shaman at one point was playing a song, and the last sentence of the song was, I was meant to live this life. Mm. And it reminded me of what you just said because of you know learning and growing, and we were meant to come here and work through these traumas because mm. she, I was waiting for her to finish that sentence of like, I was meant to live this life happily or beautifully or fully. And it was just, I'm just meant to live this life. Yeah. Right. And I think a big part of why people get stuck is they think I'm supposed to be happy all the time or life is supposed to be amazing. Why isn't it? Let me chase it. But it's like life is, you're just meant to live this life. Yeah. And that's it. And he, like Daniel helps me to remember that. Like sometimes he'll wake up and he's just not having a good day. And I, I'm a fixer. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like trying to fix and trying to be like, how can I help? And he'll look at me and he's just like, 
not today. <laughs> it's just it's just not a perfect day. But I but but I need that in a partner because that helps me to like it's the mirror that I need to to continue to to grow. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And uh, my favorite thing my favorite saying is always if you don't have a good day, tomorrow's a new day. <laughs> it's always you wake up and you feel a little better and you know that it's a new day. You can start all over. You can do anything. It's fresh. And I always think that way. My mom's always said that to me since I was a kid. So mm. it's gotten me through hard times. And it's true. The next day, I feel a little bit better. You're never all the way better, but it's an improvement from yesterday. And it'll always happen that way. Mm. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. you. Yeah, really thank nice. You. Yeah. Thank you. Aww. I enjoyed talking. Good <laughs> question. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Really.